Welcome to this webinar, Coronavirus Response Training 1, Introduction to Virtual Exchange and the Importance of Partnerships. I'm Henry Shepard, Assistant Director of the Stevens Initiative, and I want to thank my colleagues Haley Lewis, Andy Schaefer, and Phoebe Ammond, and the whole initiative team for preparing for this webinar and the following training sessions. We're so pleased to be kicking off the training and mentoring portion of our rapid response to the pandemic. If you joined our grant competition webinar yesterday, welcome back. And if you're joining one of our sessions for the first time, welcome. We're thrilled to tell you more about the initiative and about our response to the pandemic. Then we'll introduce the, our invited expert presenters to the session and the upcoming two sessions. And our presenters will dive into an introduction to virtual exchange and the importance of partnerships in virtual exchange. We'll leave plenty of time for questions and discussion at the end of the session. And before we sign off, We'll preview the upcoming training sessions as well as other opportunities to get mentoring as you work on your summer plans. To ask a question at any time, you can go ahead and click on the Q&A button and write your question there. We will make sure we look at those questions and get to them later in the session. If you have any technical issues or questions of that matter or messages to share with us, you're welcome to use the chat box. The Stevens Initiative aims to make international learning experiences available and accessible to an unprecedented number of young people through virtual exchange programs that connect young people in the US and the Middle East and North Africa. The initiative is a lasting tribute to Ambassador Chris Stevens, who dedicated his career to building bridges between people in the US and the Middle East and North Africa. Ambassador Stevens' time studying abroad as a Peace Corps volunteer in Morocco were formative experiences in his youth, and the Stevens Initiative is a, is a memorial to that, to that commitment. The initiative was conceived and developed in 2015 in close partnership with the family of Ambassador Stevens, and the initiative is sponsored by the U.S. Department of State, with funding provided by the U.S. government and administered by the Aspen Institute. Additional funding is provided by the Bezos Family Foundation and the governments of Morocco and the United Arab Emirates. Every young person must have global knowledge and skills to prosper in an interconnected and disrupted world. We know that even in the best of times, only a small minority of youth have access to in-person international experiences like studying abroad. And during a period of travel restrictions, social distancing, and economic hardship, Nearly all young people have had, have had their in-person education and exchange plans disrupted. We believe we can use technology to conduct virtual exchange to help young people remain connected and continue their international learning at all times and especially during this crisis. So what do we mean by virtual exchange? Well, we provide some terms to help understand what we're getting at. We know that in the virtual exchange field, there's a lot of discussion around what exactly uh, is part of the field and connected to the field. For us, virtual exchange are programs that use technology to connect people for education and exchange. Many programs serve young people. Many programs are international, connecting participants in different countries around the world and have some root in trying to build global competencies among other knowledge, skills, and abilities. There are several different kinds of virtual exchange programs out there, and we're thrilled to be joined by people who have a lot of experience on many of those models today as your trainer presenters. Programs vary widely in terms of the activity types they include, whether they're project-based or dialogue or discussion-based, whether they are a time-limited hackathon or pitch competition or a semester-long uh, course. There are four credit and extracurricular activities in an academic setting, as well as totally non-academic virtual exchanges that occur outside of schools and universities. And there are a huge variety of methods of communication, whether they're in real time or synchronous, asynchronous, or a mixture of those methods. Virtual exchange can also be incorporated into nearly any academic subject. Uh, these are a few of the subjects that Stevens Initiative programs have uh, have focused on over the past few years, and there are, are undoubtedly many more topics or lenses that one could use uh, to conduct a virtual exchange program. The Stevens Initiative aims to build and grow the field of virtual exchange, and we do that through three main areas of work. We make grants to organizations to run virtual exchange programs and to learn about what makes a program effective. We serve as a knowledge hub by gathering what's known from programs we support and from other practitioners and researchers and trying to share it with the wider community. 
And we try to be a leading voice in advocating for virtual exchange and policies that will improve access to virtual exchange. Over the past several months, or past few months, I should say, uh, we have felt a, a really um, a pressing need to try to contribute to uh, a response to the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, we know that there is an urgent need for more international connection and new modes of education and exchange at a time when uh, all of our activities have been greatly disrupted. And so today's training is part of a sequence of sessions that we're calling training sessions that you might think of as orientation sessions to help those who are very interested in virtual exchange get more familiar with the practice. We'll be following that with some smaller breakout sessions, which we'll talk about more at the end of today's session. You could think of this as mentoring or coaching. We'll also have several one-on-one -on -one sessions where our expert trainer presenters will be able to share more advice and feedback specific to your needs. We've added a page on our website that has a long list of resources curated from the virtual exchange community that might help you improve your practice or get involved or start a program. We've also opened a funding competition specifically for programs that connect youth in the United States and the Middle East and North Africa, whether that's adapting an in-person program or activity to be a virtual exchange, adapting an existing virtual exchange program to the current crisis conditions, or taking steps to prepare for a future, future virtual exchange. You can learn more about all of these aspects of our response on our website. There's a large banner across the top of stevensinitiative.org that leads you to our pandemic response page. I'm thrilled to introduce today's presenters and discussants. These are folks that will be leading today's meeting and also contributing to the upcoming two meetings next week as well. Ed Gregert is former executive director of Iron USA and director of Global Woods Consultancy. Today's other lead presenter, John Rubin, was creator and former director of the SUNY Coil Center and is currently director of Coil Consulting. Jamila Joffrey is an educator and the curriculum developer for the STEAM Museum project. Haloud Halifa is a facilitation fellow and senior facilitator for SOLIA and also a lecturer of journalism and politics at the University of Applied Sciences in Vienna, Austria. Ramzi Naja is head of innovation for NewView and Karam Foundation virtual exchange programs. And Taylor Woodman is an internationalization specialist at the University of Maryland Office of International Affairs. I'm very pleased to turn over the session to John Rubin to begin a presentation on the COIL virtual exchange model at the higher education level, and he'll turn it over to Ed after that. So please uh, go ahead and turn on your microphone, John, and take it away. Thank you. Uh, Henry, thank you for inviting me to speak at this important session and what appears to be a critical in uh, Today's presentations will primarily be orientational, but as Henry mentioned, there will be opportunity to follow I do feel a bit like a, an Oz behind the webinar screen here, but uh, let's proceed. We'll have a meeting. So virtual exchange has been around, although called by other names, for well over 20 years. It's become widely implemented, especially at the post-secondary level. Ed Gregert will describe later that this form at 12 level and only later propagated to the university. So all of us are engaged with social so virtual exchange or coil anyway. In our social whether they be Facebook or Instagram or LinkedIn or whatever, we network with those who are algorithms embedded in these apps are designed to let us find those with whom we have the closest affinity. In bubbles where we rarely encounter anyone different than us. This may be useful when seeking a job or a mate, but experiencing a larger and more diverse world when we are online. I'm going to make one switch speaker set up. Maybe this will help. This is, of course, the issue with doing anything online. 
let's see, is it a little cleaner now? There aren't too many things I can do on my end, but uh, anyone want to notice in the chat? Well, I'm going to just go on. Hopefully it will be fine. Um, sorry. So I'm going to just repeat the last line or two. All of us are engaged with social networks, so why do we need this virtual exchange or coil anyway? In our social networks, whether they be Facebook or Instagram or LinkedIn or whatever, we network with those who are like us. Even the software algorithms embedded in these apps are designed to let us find those with whom we have the closest affinity. Slide, please. We exist in these online bubbles where we rarely encounter anyone different than us. This may be useful when seeking a job or a mate, but it prevents us from experiencing a larger and more diverse world when we are online. This is where virtual exchange comes in. Through a range of structures and approaches, because there is more than one format of virtual exchange, we engage various others in meaningful and productive ways. In order for this experience to be valuable and transformative, it cannot be a simple flyby visit, but must involve significant interactions with new people who often live very different lives than do we. When successful, it leads to the development of new relationships and understandings about another culture, but also about oneself. And now, in the time of the pandemic, even individuals lucky enough to otherwise be able to participate in physical mobility are grounded. So those of us who support the intercultural and international exchange seek other ways to connect with the world and that is why I expect we are all here today. Slide please. This simple slide identifies me as a consultant because it is important for those like myself to share our experience with others. This is a key time as many schools uh, and other organizations hope to engage virtual exchange that we help each other. You may also note that this slide depicts the world upside down. However, when you think about it, this image of the world is really just as correct as is the image one usually sees. This view, however, has what we call the global south at the top. We are used to seeing North America and Europe at the top and center, so at first this view looks wrong, but it is equally correct. And experiencing this view of the world and seeing its value is a good metaphor for the hoped for results from the practices we will describe. The form of virtual exchange that I will mostly speak about today is called COIL or Collaborative Online International Learning. In order that my presentation be more than a lecture, I'd like to offer you all a very short quiz. And then we will together discuss, view and discuss your aggregate slide answers. So, collaboration is, this is now going to be a survey slide will come up and you will be able to choose um, which, excuse me, choose as many of these choices as you like the idea is for you to take a minute and decide are one more than one or all uh, appropriate answers to the lead in collaboration is. We'll wait for about one minute and then reveal the results. Well, maybe we can uh, look at the survey results. Okay, so these are not 
absolutely right or wrong answers, but I'm going to go through them very quickly um, because I think they reflect on some of the other topics we're going to discuss. So working together towards a common goal, most of you selected that, is certainly an aspect of collaboration, no argument. The second one is uh, a key point to realize. The fastest way for a team to complete a project usually is not collaboration. That does not mean it's not the best way to complete a project, but it takes more time, more engagement, and more structure if you're doing it in a classroom. So uh, just it's important when you're working with students, some of whom will be comfortable and some who are uncomfortable with this kind of work, uh, that you realize that some may decide to triage and avoid this kind of collaboration. So that's a piece of developing a COIL course structure. Students from different cultures listening to common lectures and reading the same texts. This is the beginning potentially of a collaborative project work, but it is not the reading and the listening that is the collaboration, obviously. It's the engagement. These students need to work with each other um, to find solutions. That's where the real collaboration is. An activity to which students are drawn in which they eagerly participate. About 40% of you chose that, and that's probably the percentage of students who in fact will eagerly participate. For some students, doing any group work is uh, somewhat anxiety provoking. Uh, so when you develop a COIL course or other kind of collaboration, you really have to think about how to engage the students and the adults, if there should be adults, in doing this kind of work. Sometimes they'll be eager, sometimes they will not, especially if in their home classrooms, they're used to listening to lectures and simply taking exams. They may not be used to collaboration. Uh, finally, the last one is probably a good definition of collaboration, a teamwork format that seeks to create interdependent participants who must work with each other to succeed. And the trick is designing something where that must does not sound coercive, but is instead sort of encouraging. Okay, let's go on to the next slide. I hope you found these questions of some interest. Yeah, let's go past the, okay. So now I'm gonna do some definitional discussion about COIL Virtual Exchange. It utilizes the internet to empower instructors around the world to develop curiosity, flexibility, and generosity in concert with academic partners. And it benefits two or more classrooms of collaborating students, usually located in different countries who've had different life experiences. And so looking back at Henry's uh, breakout earlier, this is definitely a class to class model. Um, and it's definitely an academic or usually a, a credit model. And it empowers instructors. So it's a model where the instructor, the teacher leads the endeavor. So it engages instructors and teachers in the same process and helps them uh, find new partners and colleagues and understandings. Next. So the, na the, the naming of this practice is very confusing. So I'm just gonna lay out for you my own way of looking at it. I see virtual exchange as being the broad umbrella for all this work. And I make the analogy to sports, which is a broad term, whereas COIL is one sport. <laughs> it's not very much like basketball, in fact, but it is something that can be defined. It has certain rules. It has best practices. You can get good at it, et cetera. And I think it's important to think about this because there are others practicing other sports that are not COIL, which are equally valid and interesting, but they have somewhat different dynamics and draw somewhat different clientels. Next. So it's also called many other things. We can just run down this list. Um, one of the problems is because this is a university level endeavor, many universities want to brand their program uniquely. And so what you're seeing here, some of these are local university brands. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that, but it certainly makes it more confusing for people who are new at this to find out who's doing what in the field because people are calling it different things. I'll only mention that telecollaboration is a sort of specific version of COIL where the focus is on language learning and culture. So an English class uh, in Italy might be working with an Italian class in New York, for instance. 
but this is something we just have to live with. So in more detail, I'll go through this fairly quickly, although this is rather complex. So it's embedded in accredited courses, as I said. It's co-developed by teachers in different cultures and our locations. And it's usually caught, taught by the same instructors who designed the exchange. This is very important for the model because the teachers are central. The teachers must learn about each other. And you could argue that the teachers gain as much by a COIL class experience as do the students. Next. It's offered either online or face-to-face -face with the exchange taking place online. And as we discussed earlier, it's about collaborative project work. It's not simply parallel work. It's actually getting the students to engage each other so they learn about each other's perspective. Next slide. Okay, so some of these are fairly complex. I don't have the time to go in detail, but it seeks relative equity, for instance, in, in students. Students who are coming together from very different situations may not live in a completely equitable uh, state, let's say. Some may have more mobility, some may have better internet connections, some may eat better than others, some may, et cetera, et cetera. But in a COIL classroom, it's very important to think about this, that when you're designing the interchange, to do your best to create an equitable, balanced environment for the students. Language fluency is another important piece. Um, very complex one. Um, I'm not going to explore it in detail here, but it's another whole piece of thinking about doing international exchange in all cases. It often links courses from different disciplines. We'll uh, give a couple examples in a minute. It's typically embedded into pre-existing courses and runs for a five to seven week period. The reason for this is that creating new courses in an academic accredited environment is a bit of a beast. It can take years. So what we found through experience is that you can embed it into previously existing courses and five to seven weeks seems a good length of time. It's usually an intervention into normal university practices at one or both institutions because this is unusual. It's not what people typically do at university. So it sometimes requires deans and other folks to be convinced that this is uh, something they should do. I think there's one more. Yes. And in the early days, most COIL practices were done by individual teachers, but now in many cases, they're coordinated by the institutions. Next slide. Cooperating teachers work closely with all students, but in most cases, they're enrolled, charged tuition, and awarded grades only at their home institution. There's no exchange of funds in most cases. Others have tried to do it with funding, and I'm not going to explore that today. I would also say, however, that teachers need to discuss both groups of students with each other so they understand how the other teacher and students are looking at assessment, even if they are not awarded grades in this fashion. Next slide. So here I'm going to show you two courses. Um, you can go to the next, uh, which are very interdisciplinary. Again, for time reasons, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but this is a project that was done at SUNY a few years ago. So an environmental science class works with a sociology class and they come up with a conjoined module called How Biophysical and Environmental Aspects Influence Social Patterns. The second one is even a more extreme interdisciplinary reach. I won't read it through. Um, and there are many examples where the interdisciplinariness is not as extreme as these, but it's very important. It's not English literature taught in New York and English literature taught in Turkey. That's unlikely to happen. It could happen, but it's very unlikely. So you have to think of this as an interdisciplinary practice. Next slide. This is a, a graphic that a colleague did for me 10 years ago. I keep using it. Um, I don't have time to go through it in detail, but the basic idea is that this is a bridge that we are all building to help our students connect to the world. It's built on three main pylons. Usually they're all there, international programs, professors of faculty and technology, and it requires administrative support. That probably should have been a fourth pylon, but it was added later, so it's a banner. And in the C below, you see the threats, the creatures that are either threatening the bridge or the students. Um, technophobia is less of a threat than it once was, because more teachers at least are 
comfortable with technology. Um, the faculty and staff overload crab, probably if I redid the slide, would be 10 times larger. This is the biggest issue for moving in this direction as initiating a COIL program or teaching a course requires additional work. Um, cost, there is no hard cost for most of us, but there is a lot of soft course and human resources. Last slide. Why don't we just run all these down? I'm trying to keep this short. So this is simply a list of eight possible reasons beyond what I might have said earlier and why you should engage the COIL model. I'm not gonna read them through. This PowerPoint will be available later. I'm simply gonna mention number six. Your students will gain digital literacy skills and be better prepared to work in virtual teams. This is an aspect people don't always think about, but it is an employability aspect of doing COIL work. And finally, the eighth, it will enhance your communicative skills of your students when working with non-native English speakers. The majority of people speaking English are not native speakers, and it's a real skill to be able to navigate English language speaking amongst people who have learned it from many different vantage points. So I'm gonna wrap up here. There's a lot more we could say, um, but there isn't time in this introduction. I'm gonna pass the mic, as it were, over to Ed Greger to talk about uh, some other aspects of virtual exchange. Thanks, John. Um, I wanna thank uh... Stevens Institute for initiative for putting this together. I mean, what an incredibly important uh, uh, thing to do uh, given the crisis that we're all facing. And so I just want to say thanks to Henry to your team. Um, and I'm going to just start off and, and, and kind of repeating what a little bit about both Henry and John said that this really isn't kind of a, a 30,000 feet uh, perspective. This is the general concepts uh, and it's an orientation, and we're, I'm really pleased that we're going to have another opportunity in smaller groups and perhaps in one-to-one in -one mentoring to look at some of the issues that each of the organizations and schools uh, might be exploring uh, as they look at the possibility of virtual exchanges. Um, I've put some um, general public perceptions that I've heard about virtual exchanges on the K-12 age, uh, both in, in school and out of school uh, exchanges. Um, and I'm not sure, do we have a poll on this? Henry, if we do, put it up, otherwise. I didn't make a poll, I'm sorry. Okay, okay. Um, but just looking through them, uh, you might, I'm sure that you've heard of some of these uh, that are short-term uh, virtual exchanges online are great for kind of an overview, but they can't really build in-depth cultural awareness and understanding. Um, and language learning, as John was just referring to, you really need to be immersed in the culture physically in order to learn languages. Uh, online interactions are impersonal and don't rely, result in long-term relationships. And they don't really get to know, say, the people, a host family, uh, the peers in, in the school or, or, or organization setting. And they're risky uh, because of ID theft, online bullying, Zoom bombing, which we've heard a bit about lately, and the liability issues when you're dealing with ages less than, say, 18. And finally, virtual exchange may not work because my partner or my country is, is one that in, in which uh, young people don't have access to broadband access, uh, internet access. And so particularly at this time when everybody's at home, when in fact they may only have a cell phone or they may have only one computer or a, a, a dial-in or some lesser technology. And so I think probably uh, you've heard these as too, and then um, we're gonna address some of these today and hopefully in the future, in the other sessions, we'll be able to do it uh, in more detail. And just looking kind of just the, the general uh, experience, uh, virtual exchanges succeed when, when they're structured. Uh, you heard John talk about it out of it as well, with a purposeful content. And they're around a theme and project-based, one of the categories that uh, Henry laid out uh, as, the, as possible virtual exchange types. Uh, and extending over a two to three month at a minimum. Uh, sometimes people think they're gonna do a virtual exchange in a week or two, uh, but it takes a lot more time for the relationship to be built and for the issue to be dis discussed uh, and some sort of understanding come to. Um, and really importantly, they need effective facilitation and leadership. You know, you can put people in a room, especially virtually, uh, and you can't just expect uh, the discussions to be effective, to be structured, to come out with the outcomes that an organization actually wants. 
And I've also seen that they're, exchange, they're successful when, when participants are encouraged to listen, not just talk, <laughs> and to ask questions and to respond with empathy and kind of respond with humility in terms of learning from the other. And finally, they have activities that are designed to build trust, particularly at the beginning, trust and community when participants can't actually meet each other in person. Uh, because, you know, all of us go into a room with crowded with people and the first thing we, wanted, we need to do uh, is do a little icebreaker, get to know people. And so having those kinds of activities virtually is also really key, really important. Next. And as, as uh, John was referring, uh, this virtual exchanges are not something that we that, uh, appeared uh, this year, last year. Um, and I say this uh, in terms of the organization that I was involved with, established in 1988, uh, over 30 years ago, because there are a lot of experienced people and experience with uh, or different kinds of exchanges uh, and different kinds of methodologies that you all can call on, uh, both individually, but also institutionally. And I also just point out that there are a lot of research that's been done over the last 30 years. And so you also have that, uh, and this, this is the data for research on iEARN, but there's research on all sorts of all of the various virtual exchange programs that have happened over the last uh, decades. And obviously the conclusion is that they are very powerful. Next. Uh, but before you begin, and I really appreciate this opportunity that uh, Stevens is giving all of us, is to give some thought to some serious questions before you, you jump in. <laughs> uh, and those, you can see them here. What are the objectives of your virtual exchange? Um, what's the thematic focus? And do you have a strong, equitable partner uh, that's going to be on the ground and able to help uh, the participants locally, uh, both with technology, but also with pedagogy, with, with uh, uh, content as well? And then what platform or technology is important? And, and what's a, what, what do you need to do your kind of, or what you anticipate to be your, your virtual exchange? And there's a great deal of, of platforms and technologies out there, you know, and th that the young people are both using, but many of them they haven't used before. And is that technology accessible to all? And I raise this because a number of, of you may be interested in doing virtual exchanges with uh, countries in which the technology and accessibility is not, uh, is not great, particularly now that everybody is at home. There may well be one cell phone, there may be a one computer that everybody's trying to use, there may be lousy connectivity in terms of video and audio. And so you, you need to find out from the assessment of your, with your partner as to what kinds of technologies are accessible. Next. And then looking at um, what some of our experience has shown over the last uh, few decades, um, some of the elements of a successful platform, looking at that first, uh, it's, we found that a platform that people can access via different kinds, multiple technologies. In other words, uh, you may have a computer and internet access, they may have a cell phone, and they may be able to access the internet by their cell phone, or they may be able to just use their cell phone for communication, what's up and whatever, or they may have a tablet. So having multiple entry points for technology uh, has been really key. And also a platform that allows for multimedia interaction. So of course text, uh, but also giving young people the opportunity to share and be creative and actually produce knowledge and, and uh, and, and files in video and sound and images, and to really give them kind of a, a panoply of options uh, to actually intera interact with their virtual exchange partners. And thirdly, I mean, like John also mentioned, um, it's important to, that uh, everybody remember that uh, native language is not English for most cases. And, and it's important that people be able to connect and interact and express themselves uh, in through the various kinds of multilingual uh, technologies. And, and we found actually in IRN that it was very helpful to put an instantaneous translation, both of interface, but also of all content that participants posted uh, through a partnership with Google. You know, it, it's machine translation as we know, but it, it means it, it helps to in, keep people inclusive uh, and engaged. And you know, from the very beginning, we felt it was it was important that, that young people be able to express themselves 
in their own language if they needed to, and not just in somebody else's language. And you know, many these days, uh, for example, Skype, some of the, the real-time video conferencing technologies have subtitles automatically there. They have translations now, uh, real-time. You know, are they great? No, but they help, again, maintain that inclusivity. And also, uh, a platform that's, that's flexible enough so that whether or not you're a school-based uh, program or you're an after-school club uh, youth organization, you can, have, you can use, use the platform for different kinds of purposes. And there's so many now, and we could help uh, in the later sessions look at whether it's iEarn, Edmodo, Google, uh, Google Classroom, or others, depending on what your particular need is as an organization. And very importantly, we have found over the, over the years that having the combination of asynchronous and synchronous interaction is important. And there's so many now synchronous, as we're doing right now, uh, that didn't exist, obviously, when iEarn got started way back in, in those days. Uh, but there is having that opportunity for young people to both uh, engage on a day-to-day -day basis, but also uh, periodically through video conferencing, which takes some work to arrange, takes time zone coordination and things like that. You need to have a technology and platform that's cyber secure as, as one of those conception or perceptions that I mentioned at the very beginning. Uh, there is a concern about safety, uh, particularly at the K-12 level, uh, whether it's in school or out. And so look seriously at that and we can do that later as well. And then I think most importantly, uh, a technology or platform that enables community building. Because out of this, uh, it, it comes as a successful virtual exchange, a sense of community, a sense of understanding, a, a, a deeper uh, realization of the other's uh, situation, their political, their culture, uh, and who they are as people. Next. And just to give you a very quick, and I know time is short. Um, just some examples. I mean, what, what is project-based? And just looking at some right now, for example, all the young people are at home. <laughs> and they could do incredible, as one of the projects does family history, where young people interview grandparents, parents, uh, other siblings. Uh, they talk with using technology with other family members to get a sense of what is what makes their family unique, what makes their family typical in their culture, and sharing that with video and other kinds of technologies. Um, look at environmental issues, perhaps, and one is our footprints are our future, um, and we work with an organization to create a youth uh, footprint calculator, and young people can examine their lifestyle and see how they compare both with peers in their own country, but also with their virtual exchange partners all over the world. And then if they look at the kind of issues that they're raising in terms of their lifestyle, they can work together to actually reduce their carbon footprint. Uh, that particular project had 800,000 students working on it over the last 20 years. Uh, some of the others, day in life, what it is, capture what life is like. Now, obviously, it's very different now than it was two months ago, uh, and sharing that in various multimedia forms. There's an organization called Games for Change that looks at socially meaningful games, uh, dealing with hunger, dealing with global issues, environment, other um, uh, SDG issues, and do that uh, together with the virtual exchange partners. And so they look at the, the gaming, gamifying of the virtual exchange. Um, no, one other one is the girls education. Uh, we teamed up with uh, Girl Rising, the organization who put together an amazing documentary about nine girls and the obstacles that they faced in getting a quality education. And so in this project, young people will view the video, which they can do um, either locally or through um, uh, online, and then examine the issues that are raised in each of those countries that are blocking those young people from getting education. Look at their own country. Look at the, the, the do research on what's the status of education in their country. Do people have a right to an education in their country? and then sharing that and looking all over the world in terms of actually making a difference and creating ways in which young people can have more access. And then maybe we'll look at the things like learning circles and some of the others in the smaller groups when we can identify uh, where people's priorities are. Next. And some of the lessons learned uh, over the years, uh, interactions need facilitators who are trained. And I referred to that a little bit earlier. You know, we're not, most of us are not uh, 
uh, trained to be the facilitators of a virtual exchange interaction, you know, how to ask the questions, how to motivate students to go to the next step, how to go into more depth. Uh, and so those facilitators, trained facilitators are key. And don't assume that digital natives are familiar with all kinds of technologies. Now, obviously, Instagram and TikTok and, and uh, Facebook and those uh, are daily uh, technologies kids use, but they may not be uh, familiar with the online platforms and the, and, the, and the technologies that you may adopt. And again, this repeating virtual exchange is most effective when it's a combination of synchronous and asynchronous. Uh, asynchronous, for example, allows for a kind of individual expression and engages those that are maybe a little camera shy as well uh, uh, to allow them for their more uh, personal uh, interaction uh, and in-depth analysis. And finally, make the, and, and next, making the projects, the activities project-based and extending over time so that there is, again, this process of moving from someplace to the, the outcome, the goal of a completed project on a particular issue. Next. And again, provide at the outset initial activities that build that trust and comfort. Share the netiquette of best practices for, with participants. Obviously in cross-cultural interaction where you're not in front of someone, uh, sometimes you need to have a sense of what's proper, what's, what's offensive, what's not. And so having that kind of netiquette best practice uh, orientation is really important at the very beginning. And we also found that participants if possible, should use their real names as much as legally and, and culturally allowable uh, so that sharing isn't anonymous. You know, for example, somebody who posts something under Pretty Girl 33 is taken very differently than somebody who, you know, Jane D or Jay Watson, uh, because those are real people uh, at the other end of each virtual exchange. And I think that's really important. And then uh, again, we're, we're in kind of uncharted waters these days because normally in a kind of group virtual exchange, uh, the group in each of the two countries sites are discussing the same issue um, in their classroom or in their club or something. Um, but in this case, they're all at home. And so in the uh, interaction between the international participants, it's important to make sure that the national folks uh, have a chance to interact on those same issues locally and not be overlooked. And also some of the most interesting interruptions have come over the years with people not realizing that somebody is not around. Now, again, these days everybody's at home and it's not such a big, big issue, but uh, making sure that people understand what there's just the availability of people over the period of time of the project is. And finally, monitor the number of, or have a system for monitoring the number of virtual exchanges and the hours engaged. One, so you get a sense of who's participating, who's not, who, do, who needs a little extra help to get them engaged in the virtual exchange. And also just to know how much time is actually spent engaged with the, the participants so that uh, cha courses changes can be made midstream and plans can, can be changed uh, for future activities. Thanks very much, Ed. Is it okay if I jump in and, and go to the next segment? Yeah, please. So before we move on to talking about partnerships, I was hoping to just spend a moment to ask a few of our discussants or our other presenters who will be leading sections in later sessions to, to say a little bit about their experiences with virtual exchange to add on to what um, John and Ed have shared. So I'm hoping to turn it over briefly to Khalud Halifa, who I introduced at the start of the session to say a word about the model used in the SOLIA program, which is also at the higher education level, but a bit different from the COIL model that John described. Hulud, what can you tell us briefly about your long experience with the SOLIA program? Um, thank you, Henry. So the SOLIA program um, and the outcomes are similar to um, what Ed and John talked about, but the model is different. And, and so that we, we rely heavily on, dial, on the dialogue model and cross-cultural communication. Um, we also, it takes place once every semester. It happens, um, it takes place, I think, um, mid-semester and it can run um, over the course of four to eight weeks, depending on the program. We do have a collaborate program. Um, and it, um, we have students from all over the world. So we, we target or we focus 
focus on students from uh, different interdisciplinary backgrounds and we create awareness campaigns but it's also um, it happens in real time so we take it takes place once every week for two hours uh, they can participate and um, communicate outside the session but we mainly focus within sessions so we also train our own facilitators so we have um, we have facilitators that um, they're senior facts and um, and they lead uh, most of the sessions but after the program ends we ask students if they're interested in becoming facilitators themselves after the experience and then we train them and that's how we expand our network um, the language is English uh, so people that might be um, their their main or their um, mother tongue is English. I mean, it's easier for them. But students that um, come from a different country and their second or third language is English, they need to engage in English. So we do require a basic level of English. Um, so I think that's generally what covers it. We have four programs. So we have the Connect program, uh, which is global. And that takes place between, um, so universities in different countries, we work with Asia, we work with Europe, Africa, and, um, and the United States, of course. And then we have programs that focus primarily on the US and MENA exchange. Um, and then we've got the Express uh, program as well, which, which takes place um, over the course of four weeks. So it's very quick, um, and, but also very effective. Thanks so much. So I think this is a good illustration that, um, like we showed in the very early slide in the presentation, there are models that have many different variants, whether they're academic or extracurricular or non-academic, whether they're facilitated by educators or by near-peer facilitators or others, um, and all of the subject matters and activity types that can be involved, modes of communication. So these are just a couple of them, and I know that we'll go into more detail about different variants, and I'll hopefully talking to you all about what you have in mind that suits your particular context um, in the future training sessions, as well as in the small group or breakout sessions, as, as well as in the one-on-one -on -one mentoring that we'll be offering in the weeks to come. I want to turn it over to Jamila Joffrey now to ask her a little bit Jamila, as, as you're thinking about virtual exchange in the context of remote learning due to the pandemic, what are some of the initial opportunities or pitfalls that come to your mind? You've been very involved in designing the STEAM Museum program and, and hearing some of what Ed described about virtual exchange at the K-12 level in general, where does your thinking go as you think about this circumstance? Thank you, Henry. Um, so with STEAM Museum, which is um, a, a digital museum where students from Chicago Public Schools and uh, students from Casablanca, uh, Morocco are working together to co-design a museum. Um, the, the pandemic offered us an opportunity to sort of pause and think about how young people are connecting around an issue that is relevant today that is happening right now. So um, the importance of flexibility and adaptability as our speakers uh, mentioned is really critical here. And so um, the opportunity here was to kind of switch and to think about um, how we could create um, prompts and opportunities for students to curate their own experiences by um, by video, by images, by text about the coronavirus um, uh, pandemic that's happening now. So that's sort of an opportunity that um, that, that that sort of arose as a result of this pandemic. Um, and then pitfalls. Um, there are there are a number of things. I mean, one one big thing that sort of comes to mind is equity, and um, and it's really important. Sort of thinking about uh, you know now that young people are at home, sort of assessing where our students and where our young people are at in terms of access to computers, access to technology, and also thinking about how they use technology. Again, they do use Instagram and um, other social media uh, you know platforms, but they usually use that to curate things that are important to them and meaningful and authentic to their own lives. And so um, that is something to keep in mind during this time. Thanks, Jamila. I'm really glad that we're opening several areas of conversation that we'll be able to continue later in today's session, as well as in the upcoming session. So thank you both, Halud and Jamila, for touching on a few additional subjects. I'm pleased to turn it back over to John and then Ed to talk about the central importance of international partnerships at all levels of engagement in the, uh, in the success of virtual exchange programs. So John, can I turn it back over to you?
Yes, uh, thanks, Henry. So this is um, another, in a way, a quiz. I'm, I believe you have a survey set up for this. I'm not sure. Yes? John, this one, this one I did not set up a survey. Ah, okay. Well, um, let me just discuss it as Ed did in his similar slide. So the idea here was um, to give you folks a chance to look at some options when thinking about partnerships. Um, but as you won't be able to select, um, we'll just sort of talk about them. Some of them may be a bit humorous in this context, but um, the situation with COIL Virtual Exchange, because it's university-based, is that there are a lot of ways to approach it in the early days, as I mentioned before. A lot of these exchanges were set up by individual professors. Um, now that's somewhat different or at least at many schools it is. So let's look at these options that I presented. One is international institutional partners that have already developed exchange and mobility projects. Now this is a very likely path to proceed on um, if you're one of the many, many institutions that has developed significant exchange and mobility but presently is frozen in place. The real issue though is that COIL and most of virtual exchange is a curricular-based undertaking. That is, COIL exchanges are in classrooms. They involve the teaching and learning and assessment. So in discussing with potential partners, they need to be aboard that concept. Um, it's quite different than a lot of other kinds of exchange. Um, so I would say international institutional partners are a great basis for developing COIL um, when it's, um, it's appropriate. Uh, in the earlier days of COIL, don't mean to keep going back to the beginning, but there were so few, inst uh, here's an ambulance going by, I wonder if you can hear it, but uh, that's the world we live in, I'm in Brooklyn. Um, that in the earlier days, so few study abroad and international offices were involved with virtual exchange that they often didn't engage it whatsoever. But now things have changed, not just due to COVID, but over the last years where curricular internationalization has become taken much more seriously, the people in the international office may indeed be great people to turn to your par existing partners if you have them. Institutions located in similar time zones, um, well, this is not a necessity, but it actually helps. Um, many COIL exchanges are asynchronous. Ed was talking about this mix of synchronous and asynchronous. But when you're doing synchronous work, it actually is um, easier if you're in a similar time zone to a partner. I wouldn't use this as a driver as to who you find you know, identify as partner, but it is relevant. If it's, uh, you know, New York to uh, Sao Paulo, you have one hour time difference. If it's New York to Osaka, you have 13 hour time difference. So for synchronous work, it makes a difference. Uh, institutions located in different states or regions within the same country. Well, this would on the surface seem like it would not be the grounds for partnership, but I would actually make the case that it is. Um, it's not typical because this work has mainly been seen as international, but uh, developing, let's say, an exchange between West Virginia and Oregon, or between New York and Hawaii, or even within a state, they're very different populations that are living 30 miles apart. I think there are many ways which we can exchange and learn about our diversity that are not truly international. Um, this next one, members of the COIL Virtual Exchange Consortium. Um, I'm embarrassed to say now that I'm just reading these off. There is no such organization, but there are a couple with similar names. Um, the International uh, Virtual Exchange Consortium does exist. But the problem is that there is at present no organization that is uh, managing partnering on a national or international level. There are many organizations that have, are involved with partnering, but nobody you can just simply turn to and say, I'd like a COIL partner in Turkey and they'll give you a list. That doesn't exist. Um, faculty members who have met previously at conferences or joint, through joint research, that indeed was probably the primary way that professors met and started COIL work 2015, even 10 years ago. But as I said, primarily now, 
the need is for a university or college to establish a COIL office or whatever they wish to call it, which can in fact look through research collaborations that do exist, find other resonances with other institutions, really look under the hood to find why one school would be a good partner and proceed and then help the professors at your school engage those uh, potential partners. Next slide. So collaborative online international learning is an inherently networked model of education. That's one of the reasons it's somewhat radical actually. COIL courses cannot exist on a single campus. Um, they require an actively engaged international partner. So while University X could decide on its own with proper funding to let's say build a medical school, University at X could not launch a COIL course without a partner in another country. So this is quite unusual for many aspects of, of the work that higher education does. And there are many criteria for the choice of partners, which are often based on curricular drivers. So despite my earlier comments about interdisciplinariness, I think the place to look is what teachers are interested in doing this kind of work how to promote it to them and engage a sizable group of professors who find this of interest and would make the time to do it. Uh, then look at your potential partner network through whatever means you have of identifying them and reach out. Because in the end, these partners are the central aspect of doing COIL and doing almost all virtual exchange. Um, so I'm not gonna go further at this point, um, I'm simply going to say that later on when we meet in smaller groups that these kind of discussions might be more productive in that context where individuals or individual institutions might be able to proceed down their own unique pathways. Thanks. Next slide, which is really a kind of goodbye slide. Somebody asked in the chat for contact information. So indeed there's an email there. Thank you. And then picking up, thanks, John, um, on the K-12 level, um, you, your description of, of going around and meeting people at conferences is exactly what happened in the early days of IRN as well. The early days of ISTE, the International Society for Technology and Education, their annual events and anything else where there might be people who internationally that might be interested in doing something like this, we drag them to the table. Um, and so you guys now are in a very different situation uh, in 2020. Now, I know that there's school-based programs in the, on the audience, but there's also kind of after-school youth organization, club type organizations, and those partnerships are gonna be very different. Uh, if you have an existing partner, you know, I saw that AFS is, is uh, part of the participants today, you may well have an AFS chapter in that country. Uh, and what's important is that you know that, that the partner knows and shares the project's ob objectives. You need to spend a quite a bit of time uh, because that partner is key, uh, who kn knows so that they know uh, what the purpose is, they know what the technology you're going to be using is, uh, and they're familiar with it. Uh, they can provide structured vulture exchange support for the local su participants in their own language, presumably if they're having difficulties connecting or if they're having uh, difficulties with the subject matter. And they can intervene if and when the technology fails. Now, folks, <laughs> These days, technology doesn't fail a great deal, uh, but it can. And particularly in these days in some countries where, again, uh, like the equity issue that was mentioned earlier, uh, as I mentioned, in some countries, uh, some Iraq, Palestine, Yemen, some of the, the MENA region countries where the connectivity and the access to technology may not so, be so great in the home. And that's when the problem may well occur. And that partner needs to be able to jump in and play an assisting role uh, to bring that particular, and it could be this time, there, there are many people who are in different situations instead of a group. Uh, so it may be more difficult than uh, in earlier days before the pandemic. Next. But if you're looking for a partner, and you know, this is kind of repeating actually what John just said, uh, look at, because you're in a good situation in 2020 because there are a lot of organizations and you've heard some of the models here today, work directly with one existing virtual exchange organization because they undoubtedly have a partner in the country that you're interested in working in. 
for example, iron has an iron organization in every country that it works in, in 130 countries. And so reach out to the existing organizations to serve uh, or to identify a potential partner. Uh, there's also something called the Virtual Exchange Coalition uh, that is made up of organizations that do virtual exchanges. Reach out to them. Uh, obviously, the Stevens Initiative has incredible resources and ideas on organizations that either have started uh, or have expressed interest in virtual exchanges. And as, as, as John and I just mentioned, reach out to the people who have uh, been in the field for a while. And I'm really pleased, actually, that, again, like John said, in the, in the breakout room sessions, but also in the one-to-one -one mentoring, we can work because we, have, we know a fair number of people in the field. And so we can work with you to identify an organization or individuals that might be uh, in the same uh, either education or non-education or in the same uh, age group that you're looking to, to work with. Um, and then finally, spend adequate time getting to know the partner if the partner is new and provide orientation and training for that proposed project. Because without that orientation and training and facilitation skills uh, on the partner level as well as on your level, it's not going to be very easy to under, undertake virtual exchanges in my experience. And these are just a few ideas. Uh, again, uh, in the smaller groups, we'll be able to be more tailor uh, possibilities for partners to your particular interests and needs. And so I also want to next to say thank you to everyone. And here's my contact information as well. Uh, if, and feel free to reach out at any time. I'm happy to, um, to connect with you. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much, Ed and John. Uh, what a pleasure to get to hear from you, uh, to hear your perspectives about these sort of foundational aspects of the programs and, and realms that you're most familiar with. Um, and we're really pleased now to open the floor for questions. Some of you have already typed questions in the Q&A feature at the bottom of the, of the Zoom uh, application. You can keep doing that. Some of you have raised your hands to ask questions out loud. Assuming that the technology cooperates with us, I will try to unmute you so that you can take the microphone and pose your question that way. Um, so please feel free to raise hand and I will try to call on you. I'll just uh, take a moment to let you type additional questions or to raise your hand if you have any questions. They can be about any aspect of what you've heard today as far as presentations. And while we're getting our cameras turned on, um, we'll try to wait for a few more questions to come in. So I'll ask the presenters to go ahead and be on camera. Wonderful. Oh, are we missing anybody? I don't think we are. Um, we have one question that came in a moment ago and I'm hoping that maybe Taylor could start off by answering this one. The question is, have we noticed any pitfalls for a new virtual exchange program or early virtual exchange experience for people who have most familiarity with in-person exchange or study abroad. I think maybe in your experience at the Office of International Affairs at Maryland, you might have seen a lot of folks who tried to make the transition from study abroad or in-person exchange programs to virtual exchange. And I'm wondering what those dynamics are often like. Yeah, thanks, Henry. And thanks for the question. I, I, I'm sure many of us are finding ourselves in that space of needing to develop a virtual exchange uh, from a place where there used to be a study abroad. I think first and foremost, just noting that they are very different uh, modalities for engagement and that it's, uh, I, I think the, the thing that uh, an instructor needs to take into consideration are what are the priorities or core goals for learning and what are the ways that you can develop that. So, uh, what I mean by that really is thinking about what can be delivered asynchronously versus synchronously. So I think what's really important typically is the learner to learner contact in the synchronous space, where maybe some of the background information, the context uh, for engaging that particular culture or community could be delivered in a more uh, asynchronous space or through other modalities through uh, reading or film discussions that students could then be paired with in a synchronous space. Um, I, I uh, will I have a, a variety of other options, but I know we're kind of limited on time, and I know we'll be discussing this in um, our third training as well, but I wanted to also offer um, the other participants to engage in that as well. So, thanks, Henry. Does anyone else have something they'd like to add on the question of going from study abroad or, or exchange in person to virtual? Uh, yeah, I would just add that uh, it's really part of a larger process. Um, 
uh, Taylor sort of said this, but in other words, I think it's very important that international programs offices, uh, albeit maybe now in a crisis format, uh, engage the curriculum in general. Um, once they're engaged with the curriculum, then they can move into virtual exchange. But to go directly from uh, physical exchange to virtual exchange with no engagement with university curriculum is going to be a big leap. Um, and different programs have moved more or less in that way up till now. I'm speaking strictly in the post-secondary area. Ed, if I'm not mistaken, I think I earn uh, has considerable experience, obviously with, with virtual exchanges, but also with some in-person exchange programs. What has it been like to, to straddle that or to have an organization that does both as, well as their competencies? Great question. Um, actually, in the very earliest days, when it was between the U.S. and USSR, there were ex physical exchanges built into every relationship when it was just uh, like 24 schools. Uh, and it was people found that, in fact, a lot of the project work actually got completed <laughs> when the kids actually got together. Uh, and so it was really a, a, a stimulus to get things done. Uh, current, most in the last 10, 12 years ago or so, they've been one of the implementing partners uh, for both the YES program, Youth Exchange and the Study Abroad, as well as the NISLI Y program, the National Security Language Initiative. And th having those structured um, organizations in place uh, around the world made the IRN kind of a natural partner to provide language training for US kids who were then going to that country physically. And so some of the orientation before they went was done online. Uh, and some of the, the uh, interactions in the particular language that the NISTI kids were, were learning was also shared online, but also after returning as alumni. They used technology to stay in, uh, connected, but also to continue actually language uh, practice in, in the NISTI case. In the YES uh, program, uh, similarly, uh, they had a series of, and depending on the country, uh, a series of preparatory work that they needed to do before they left their home country. And that was all done online prior to arriving. And so to a certain extent, they knew each other prior to the physical exchange. And so it really was an enhancement uh, to that physical exchange experience. Thank you. I'm going to try to turn it over to an audience member to ask a question out loud. I'm going to try to call on Michelle Miller, who raised their hand. Michelle, I'm going to click allow to talk in a moment and you can give it a shot. All right, you've been allowed to talk, so you can unmute and talk. Okay. Go ahead. We hear you. Yeah, my question was, are, is there any place that has like a listing of universities abroad that already do a virtual exchange? I, I work at uh, Kennesaw State University in uh, Kennesaw, Georgia, and, mm -hmm. and we currently do partner universities uh, exchange programs. And I'm looking at this whole idea of virtual exchange, which is kind of new to me and to our university. I think the, 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 the beginning of an answer to this great question harkens back to what John Rubin said during his presentation, which is that there isn't really a single place to look. Um, but he did mention a few hubs uh, where, where you can find more. He mentioned the International Virtual Exchange Conference, or IVEC, I-V-E-C, as one place. It's, it's, it's an in-person event, but there is a bit of a community that's, been, that's built around it over many years as it's evolved to its current form. Um, it's highly overlapping with the COIL community, and I don't know that there's a single database for the COIL community as a whole, but um, whether it's the IVEC website or and the proceedings of the IVEC conference, which I imagine you can find online that would give you a sense of where to start at the higher education level. Um, there are several partners listed on the projects page of the Stevens Initiative website, but that's more historical than it is a directory for upcoming projects. And I'd, I'd turn it over to anybody else here at the higher ed level who's familiar with any other good resources. Looks like John wants to start. Yeah, I mean, the way it develops is that individual universities put in a lot of effort to develop their networks. And then I guess, understandably, I have mixed feelings about this, have a tendency not to fully share them uh, because they're their partners. Um, uh, however, that's varying very much. SUNY has always had a tradition of making relative public their uh, coiling partners so that people could visit the SUNY website and identify who was active in that network. 
I don't want to speak for SUNY at present, I'm not there. Um, but many other universities such as DePaul or Drexel in the United States, Coventry in England, uh, the Hay University of Applied Science, I'm just throwing names out, Amsterdam University of Applied Science in the Netherlands. These are all schools that are doing a lot of this work and it's not appropriate to just verbally throw all the names out here, but unfortunately there isn't a central storage and I'll just add one little plug here. I hope this doesn't seem, I think this is important, but may sound like a, uh, a plug is that I'm working with a colleague in Italy on a book called The Guide to Coil Virtual Exchange, which hopefully will be published this coming winter, so it's still nine months away. And in it, there will be an appendix with such a list, although it will be far from complete um, for the reasons I just mentioned. Uh, Henry, I might mentioned that uh, I earned his work with Kennesaw on several occasions in the past. And I can tell him sometimes you know, institutions don't know what's happening across the room, or I mean, across the campus. And so I'd be happy to share with Michelle, if I could have her contact information, the faculty that have been involved in uh, virtual exchange and virtual programs uh, at Kennesaw. Taylor? Yeah, and I would just uh, second to Michelle that uh, there, Kennesaw State has a very active division of global affairs, a similar unit to what I'm in at University of Maryland, and they have a partnerships division. So I would uh, recommend also just reaching out to the centralized unit there to see if they're currently thinking about uh, developing these or if they already have current list like Ed or John have, have said as well for your particular institution. And I think this gets to a, a deeper point as well, and I'm grateful for all the context you and the ideas you're sharing. I think we might be at a stage of development uh, or diffusion of the concept of virtual exchange or some analogous or similar practices that it's becoming common enough that there are clusters or pockets of it in almost any institution or community. It might not be widespread, it might not be known to everybody in the community, but um, we've found time and again that folks are able to bump into colleagues or peers that they might not have known were involved in something similar or aware of something similar or had participated in something similar. Um, but there, there are, there's the, some foundational elements to really build and take this whole practice to uh, the next level to seek more institutional support to make the case that this is really a, a widespread practice, even if it's not widely recognized. Uh, I have a question to turn a bit um, but I think this will broaden the conversation in a valuable way. The question comes from Carolyn, and uh, Carolyn says, with many students currently forced into virtual learning formats, I'm wondering if we can unpack and hear more about student engagement and student buy-in. Can folks share more thoughts and recommendations for student buy-in or student-led experiences, especially given our current context where many students might feel a loss of agency in their educational experience? I can, hello everyone, talk a little bit about this. Um, thank you, Henry. Uh, so um, having kind of witnessed firsthand this, this transition over, over the past few weeks um, at a variety of, of locations, I, I could speak a little bit to the kind of strange, unexpected, but also expected things we faced. Um, a lot of students, so in our, in our programs in Turkey, a lot of students had, you know, the, the the typical difficulties like not enough computers in the home, not enough internet connections. Also, also in certain schools in the U.S., kind of um, that are more rural, much less internet stability. So this is kind of the, the most immediate difficulty that's that's faced in, in an abrupt transition. Uh, but uh, what I've been a bit more interested in is is kind of the social dynamic and how technology um, impacts that, and kind of the psyche of students or how on a personal level they're dealing with this. Um, so a lot of a lot of our students, um, when speaking with their counselors, you know, express a, a lot of difficulty in not having a sense of community to go with their educational experience. Um, so that is certainly something we, we've been thinking about and putting effort into into incorporating. Um, just kind of to say that it's it's not just about the learning as in absorbing information, but also interacting with colleagues, finding these informal spaces to talk, so on. Um, and another. Um, kind of little effort we found to be very impactful is um, that we started having um, larger group lectures that happen um, uh, on a weekly basis usually that that align with with the other themes and topics being learned um, during that time period so students are kind of 
attending a, or a webinar, let's say, or engaging with other students, with, with other speakers outside of the like more formal Zoom class environment um, that kind of, it, it gives them a little bit of relief, but also builds this momentum of being you know, in the right mindset to be learning about said topic. And just um, not sure if this answer goes directly to the question, but uh, we have found over the years that in fact, the, the virtual exchange, the interaction with real people, authentic audiences, their peers, actually uh, enhances motivation to learn whatever subject the student is actually enrolled in during that virtual exchange. And this is true for the language courses, because most people don't understand why they should be learning a language in this country. <laughs> And all of a sudden they had to be in front of a camera in front of real time with Ru Russian kids and had to appear to know something. And so the, the reasons for learning the language became very apparent. And so they were motivated to, to stay in. And that's true for the STEM uh, curriculum courses as well, because people don't necessarily understand why they have to learn all the chemistry and biology and stuff. But when you put it into a project context and put it into a real issue, um, with maybe comparing the river qualities or air qualities or something like that with the, with their peers, then they get motivated actually to to go further and ask questions and and inquire more uh, about that subject that they would have not have done at all when they were part of a, a classroom isolated from a virtual exchange. Going to try to call on someone else who raised their hand. Zoe, I'm going to call on you in just a moment. You're welcome to unmute yourself, Zoe. Yes, hi, thank you very much. Um, I just want to share just my experience this semester. I'm involved in a virtual exchange course with the university in France, and the course is in French. Actually, not the course, but the experience of the students is in French. And I want to say that the students are much more motivated this semester to engage with their peers there, and especially talking about their experiences under the coronavirus and their lives and other parts of the society and what they're faced with at this time. And it is no longer, you know, in a formal setting, the professor and them talking in video conferencing, but they find their own ways to communicate and share um, everything they want to share in, in French, which is, you know, a rewarding experience for me. Did anyone, especially those who were not the lead presenters today, have anything to share about language? I know that the STEAM Museum program often incorporates an aspect of language learning because Chicago has some um, Arabic intensive schools. Jamila, could you say a word about what it's like for the language to be a, a factor in the exchange? I know it's always a factor, but I'm thinking especially of programs that do try to use a language other than English. Um, yeah, we um, use Arabic. We have um, Arabic classes and French classes in Chicago um, when we partner with our um, Casablanca groups. And um, with, with language, I think what's really important um, is sort of going back to, um, I think Taylor had said this about the asynchronous, like having your goals in mind when you have asynchronous and synchronous, um, you know, uh, moments in your curriculum. And so the asynchronous is really important because it's an opportunity for students to feel comfortable in a safe space to reflect and to um, really sort of hone in on the, the language and really think about what they want to say, how they want to say it before they do it in a synchronous setting. Um, interestingly, the synchronous settings um, did happen in English, but that was, um, and Arabic, um, but those are choices. And I think this is really important. They're choices that the students themselves made um, to communicate in those languages. So being sort of self-directed um, there is really important in the synchronous settings. There was an article in the New York Times this morning that some of you may have seen about the drawbacks of video conference-based communication, the, the perils of Zoom, the idea that um, even the minor effect of a delay or the fact that I'm looking at a camera and not looking right at you uh, means that we're not able to read each other's cues properly and that this can have a really harmful effect on our ability to connect on an emotional level, to engage with each other. Um, I'm. I'm not asking this uh, merely to 
ask you, you people who clearly believe in virtual exchange to some degree, to try to refute this point. But I'm curious to know if we recognize the challenges of virtual communication um, or if we try to design programs to overcome perhaps some fundamental risks, what ways do you see of accommodating or recognizing what we all know to be challenging about this setting? What, what makes you think this is worth your time that you're doing more good than harm? I would just say that I can't respond to the article you read, Henry, because I haven't read it, but, and there certainly are great limitations to the Zoom or video conference format along with its strengths. But I think it's really important to have students go out into their community, bring things back, and whether it be synchronous and especially asynchronously, it's not just this headshot talking to headshot deal. To me, that's a very limited way of thinking about what we're doing. It's very important for there to be real research, exploration, bring other people into the discussion and really start to try to embody the exchange. It can be really like uh, very strange as I'm sure a lot of us are experiencing these days where you're just talking to millions of talking heads. Uh, and uh, there are limits to that. It's good, it's great that we can do it now. 20 years ago, you couldn't do it at all. But the other part of it, what's in the background, the life of these folks who are communicating, that is what needs to be brought to the fore to keep this rich. Ramsey, if I could call on you really briefly and then maybe turn to Ed. Um, I know in the program that the Stevens Initi Initiative supported, we were connecting young people in the United States, including in the Boston area with young people who are Syrian refugees in Southern Turkey. And the difference in experience is really profound. Um, and it did include, and this is why I wanted to turn to you, the program really did include a lot of hands-on community engagement outside of the video conference. Um, what did you see as the, the benefits brought by that kind of engagement? And were there any residual challenges that still made it hard for the people involved in the program to meet each other um, as full as full people? Thank you, Henry. Um, yeah, this, this is definitely a great question. And um, I think what John said, I completely agree with, but specifically what I wanted to build on is, is the community aspect. So with our very first um, virtual exchange studio, um, the way we kind of boosted this engagement was by allowing students to work with disabled individuals who were in Rehamli, Turkey. So automatically students in Turkey were connecting these individuals to their colleagues in Florida at the time. Um, so that alone kind of established a certain rapport that you know can't artificially be built, but also kids were doing a lot outside of the computer screen. So for, for kind of the, the type of exchange we do, having students work together on a project that has community impact, sometimes in both locations, sometimes in one of them, and, and sometimes even in a third location, has been absolutely fundamental. Um, you know, on top of that, in, engagement levels change, or what kids are able to connect with changes a lot. That doesn't mean every time we've done this, it's worked perfectly, but there, there might be students who kind of are only able to connect if that impact is there. Um, and at the same time, there might be students who are more comfortable than others. I mean, I think we all now know that Zoom fatigue is, is absolutely real. I haven't read the article, but I've read a few of the type. And, and um, you know, kids don't get as tired as grown-ups, but they do get tired as well. So definitely kind of giving them breaks between these things and allowing them to use their hands and build something that they take a photo of, share with a colleague. All of this, you know, content-based asynchronous exchange was also absolutely fundamental. I was just thanks, Ed. Just a word. Yeah, go just, ahead. Just a word. I think also the whole uh, revolution in mobile technologies is really changing because, you know, we're all perhaps maybe all I'm sitting in front of a laptop, a computer, but young people with a phone or an iPad are going to walk around. They're going to show people what different parts of their community, their family, their lives, in a way that was never possible before. Uh, so I think getting out of the concept of you know nine boxes on a screen and really being able to use the mobile technology where it's most powerful, I think is something that they're really, really good at. Thanks for adding that. I'm gonna have one more question. We'll try to do another take the mic question. This one's to Nadia. Thanks for raising your hand and you can talk. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yep, loud and clear. Okay, thanks. 
I just had two questions and you kind of touched on one of them a little bit, but the first question is about advice for how K through 12 students can share or showcase their virtual exchange experiences with other peers in their local communities. Um, and the other question is specifically for Ed. I'm participating in an iEARN learning circle right now, and I wanted to know if you view learning circles as sort of an introduction for teachers, and then they graduate to more sort of in-depth iron projects or um, do teachers choose to either use learning circles or the more in-depth projects or it just sort of depends? Uh, Henry, I'm not sure how much time. Why don't you have. try to answer the second one really briefly and then we'll get to the first. Uh, okay. Uh, the, the second question dealing with learning circles and I'm not sure how sure. many people even know what it is. A learning circle is a group of maybe 10 or 12 or uh, usually it's classes. Now I don't know because classes aren't together. Uh, and they're placed uh, all as a group and with a very structured week by week assignment activity for, for a period of maybe two months or so. And so it's the online kind of a curriculum project that most approximates the traditional classroom because the teacher knows what's expected of him or her. Uh, and knows what's expected of, of the students and knows that they're going to get actually serious and meaningful responses from their circle of members. And to answer the question, I think it, uh, it often is an inter introductory uh, way for teachers at the K-12 level to get into virtual exchanges because it um, is the one that they're most familiar with and it's the one that they have to do kind of the least amount of planning and thinking uh, as to how to both engage their students but also maybe to actually assess or evaluate them. And so I think, I think that's probably the case. Uh, the experienced teachers more will on a portfolio basis have their students go off and do things and come back and report what they've done, uh, which takes uh, a lot more experience in virtual exchange at the K-12 level than a learning circle does. Nadia, can you please and really briefly restate the first of your two questions? Sure. Um, so the question is about advice or best practices for how K through 12 students can share or showcase their virtual exchange experiences with other peers in their local communities. I'm so sorry to ask my colleagues to just give me a 10 second answer just to send Nadia off in the direction to learn more about this. So maybe Jamila, Ramsey and Ed could just say a word, if anything from the programs they're familiar with. Um, yeah, um, I can start. Thanks for the question, Nadia. Um, so two things. One is that with STEAM Museum, we, cho we intentionally chose a platform that would push students' work um, to a public-facing website. So in a time where social media posts are so um, temporary, right, and temporal, that there was this longevity aspect to it. And then the second thing I would say is um, to ask students themselves. I think it's really important there to, the, you know, to make sure that there's an opportunity to bring students in and ask them kind of what portals they want to use um, to share their work with their peers. And I definitely second social media to state the obvious, but also what kids think is a good space for, for things to be displayed is, is probably the right answer in this case. Ed, anything to add? Yeah. There, yeah, there's a lot of opportunities for like kids sharing videos from the work that they've been doing, but also right now, ra local radio and TV are looking for things to put on that are in an educational context because uh, there's no schools. And mm -hmm. so we've been told by teachers all over the world that uh, the TV and radio, local broadcast, are looking for that kind of student-generated material that can actually be part of an educational program. John, it looks like you want to say something, yeah. so just, just five quick, seconds. Yeah, I just one thing we haven't brought out is the possibility of what I would call creative or artistic exchanges. Um, it's not all about putting facts on the table or even sharing your community as a visual, but it's getting people to write together, to do videos together, to, you know, actually get into creative activities together. You learn a lot by somebody, from somebody else to see how they draw, how they write fiction, how maybe they ch shoot a, uh, a video that isn't just, this is my house. So I just throw this in the pot because this is a whole interesting area to explore in virtual exchange. Thank you. I'm so sorry that we've gone a little over time. It was just out of a, an abundance of enthusiasm. And I know we have so much more to cover. So I'll just ask my colleague to quickly uh, share the slides again for a moment so that I can say thank you all so much for being here. 
here are some next steps that if you're interested in learning more, here's what you can do. We have two more training sessions with these fantastic uh, presenters next week, Jamila and Halud on Wednesday on activity planning and content planning and facilitation on the 5th. On the 7th, we have a session co-presented by Ramsey and Taylor on uh, technology, logistics, and overcoming common challenges. You can sign up for those just as you did uh, with this on the links you might have received from an email from us or visiting the link on the bottom of the page, the pandemic response page for the Stevens Initiative. We'll be holding some breakout sessions beginning on May 4th. We've listed a few sessions by Ed and John and Halud. Um, we'll be sharing links to those signups in the email that we send all of you after today's session. So it'll be a thank you for attending email and it'll include links to those breakout session signups. In the near future, we'll be sharing links to sign up for one-on-one -on -one mentoring sessions. That portal is not open yet. We'll be opening that in the, in the days ahead. And as I mentioned at the beginning, we're also offering a grant competition for those running US, Middle East, and North Africa virtual exchange programs, as well as online resources. If more information about all of this is available on the Stevens Initiative website, the link to which is at the bottom of the page. So a big thank you to our presenters and to my colleagues for making this meeting happen. And we look forward to hearing from you by email or seeing you in uh, the next session. Thanks so much. Take care, everyone.